Have you ever said the phrase, but not really meant it, uh, the, the phrase, I'm working on it? You ever said, I, I'm working on it? I, I'm working on it. Um, there was a time in Bible college where uh, I was working 20 to 30 hours a week uh, in group homes. Um, I was uh, interning at a church for about 20 hours a week, and then I was a full-time student as well. And so in the craziness of that stage of life, and also trying to have a social life at the same time, um, which did not always work out well, um, but I think my my like key, that was just great timing, isn't it? Um, the, my, my key phrase uh, for my professors was, I'm working on it. I'm pretty sure they, they thought it was just my slogan, uh, I'm working on it on it. Um, you ever, you ever had a project like that where it's just like been so overwhelming that you're just like, you know, your, your spouse is on you a little bit gents and like, I I thought you, this was going to be done already. And, and I'm, I'm working on it. And, and then you go and, and you go to look at that project and you think of all the little things that need to be done and this and that, and do we have enough of this and do we have enough of that? And before you know it, time has passed and you're out of time to work on that project. And so you walk in the door and, and uh, it's, it's how, how far did you get? I'm working on it. Here's, here's my, uh, there's a joke out there that every, every husband is part of a couple more days construction, that that's the, the company because it's always a couple more days. But here's the, here's the fear I have for us, is that we've been, we've been very clearly given a task here on this earth, and that's to make disciples. Making disciples is not just uh, uh, going out and, 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 and preaching, it's, it's about making people, who, making people into people who serve Jesus, who love Jesus. I've heard it said once that you haven't made a disciple until your disciple makes a disciple. That that's how we're supposed to look at discipleship. Well, here's, here's my fear, is that we've been given this mission to make disciples. And what we're really saying is, I'm working on it. That we're saying, I'm working on it, but we know that we're not really working on it. We're paralyzed in it. Matthew 28, 18 to 20 says, And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. And so we've heard sermons, we've heard people bring big messages on how we should go and make disciples and how we need to go into all the earth. And and maybe you've heard a missionary come in and speak and say, say, Jesus will not return until everyone has heard the gospel. And and they've they've put this this, uh, idea on you that you need to go and make disciples. And and so you've you've thought, oh, my workplace is full of people that I could make 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 disciples out of. And and there's, 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 uh, you know, kids clubs that, that my kids are a part of that I could maybe try and make some disciples in. And, and, and my church is small groups, and so I'm a part of those. And so maybe there's a, an aspect of me making disciples in that. But if we're really honest, what we're saying is, I'm working on it. We're not engaging. And I think the big thing is that we're not engaging ourselves in becoming a disciple. What does it say at the end of that set of verses? It says uh, to teach them to observe all that I have commanded you. How are we supposed to teach those around us when we have not taught ourselves? So as a pastor, I was looking at my, my own life and I was going, how are we creating disciples? Because I do believe that there are pastors out there that are, are pastoring churches. And I believe that there was, there's been seasons where I have been that pastor as well, where it's going, where you're going, are we creating disciples? Are we making disciples in and through this church? And so I wanted to be able as a pastor to rest my head on the pillow going, I know that we are making disciples. However many it may be, whether it's a lot or a little, we have the the framework in place to know that if someone is willing to be discipled, that they will be discipled. My, My thinking had to shift. Because in the North American church, I think we've sold ourselves on discipleship by osmosis. 
that the idea is that we would live a good enough Christian life, that we would be a little more happy, a little more joyful, a little more full of life in, in the storms of life and in the things that hit us. And, and we thought maybe, just maybe, if I'm good enough, if I live a good enough life, that it will be attractive enough to those that surround me that they'll ask me a question and give me an opportunity. And so we've built this evangelistic uh, method off of, off of just trying to live well and live a good life. And I believe that living a good life is what we're supposed to do, that we are supposed to love our neighbor as ourselves, that we are supposed to, uh, uh, you know, follow the, the commandments of God. And we are supposed to, to see those fruits come in and through our lives and that people will take notice. But I just don't know that discipleship by osmosis is the way that Jesus designed it. It might get that initial question. It might be an example. And I'm sure all of us can think of an example or a testimony that we've heard sitting in church one day where a video has popped on the screen and someone's telling their story. And, and I remember this one person who was just different, who was just this. And so that's what we're hoping our life would be. But I don't know that that is the story that Jesus laid out in How to Make Disciples. Jesus walked with his disciples, and then he sent them out. But before he sent them out, he taught his disciples. In fact, if we read scripture carefully, we'll find that he taught crowds things in parables so that they wouldn't understand them, but then explain them to his disciples who were following him. Matthew 13, 10 to 13, it says, Then the disciples came and said to him, Why do you speak to them in parables? And he answered them, To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. For to the one who has, more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. This is why I speak to them in parables. Because seeing, they do not see, and hearing, they do not hear, nor do they understand. See, this is, this is a hard thing to wrestle with, right? Jesus, why would you... Why would you not want everyone to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven? Why would you not want everyone to to know what you mean by these parables? And we've had pastors explain these parables to us for a lot of years. We've had preachers design entire sermon and sermon series around certain parables and, and, and break them down and explain it. And yet we've watched as churches have walked through those series and seen no change as, as a group because, because it's just not hitting the heart. And here's the key. The crowds were following Jesus to hear words that excited them and see signs that, that, that excited them, that got them, got them impassioned. They sought signs and they sought wise little sayings. But it was the disciples that left what they had to follow Jesus. It was the disciples that sacrificed something in and of themselves. It was the disciples that gave up life and home for the sake of following Jesus. And so Jesus speaks in parables to those who just wanted his stuff, but didn't necessarily want to follow his ways. And so when he talks about making disciples, he's not talking about gathering a big group of people who will listen to wise sayings and hope to see some sort of spiritual outpouring of some sort and call it church. He's looking for a group of people who will hear his word, will obey it, and will follow it to its completion. This is what we are meant to be, church. And so we have kind of gotten into this this stage of life where we're hoping that osmosis will be discipleship. But osmosis is not discipleship. It is not what we are supposed to do to make disciples. It may be an aspect, but it is not it in its entirety. We are to be people who follow and obey God's word and show others how to follow and obey God's 
word together. This is what a disciple is meant to be. John 8, 31 to 45, we're going to skip a few verses in, in it, but it says, So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. I know that you are offspring of Abraham, yet you seek to kill me because my word finds no place in you. I speak what I have seen with my father. I speak of what I have seen with my father, and you do what you have heard from your father. They answered him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would be doing the works Abraham did. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. This is not what Abraham did. Jesus said to them, if you, if God were your father, you would love me for I came from God and I am here. I came not of my own accord, but he sent me. Why do you not understand what I say? It is because you cannot bear to hear my word. You are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. Whoever is of God hears the words of God. The reason why you do not hear them is that you are not of God. This is a sobering group of verses. Because he's going, you can have your own, you can have your own way. You can think of yourself as being a child of God. You can think of yourself as being someone who is serving God. But if you will not listen, if you will not receive the words that he says, if you will not do something about the words that he has said to you, then you will not be a disciple. You will not be those who are following Jesus. So in this set of verses, it says that disciples are to be hearers, abiders, knowers and doers of God's word. The problem is that a lot of times I think we grow content, just like the crowds, to hear the words we do not understand as long as Jesus keeps doing his miracles, but it leads us to trying to piece together a puzzle that does not fit. This is, this is what, I'm, what I'm saying, church, is that we gather and we hope to see something. We hear of churches far off where, where there is an outpouring of the Holy Spirit and where we, we see miraculous signs and wonders and we hear testimonies of people who have been healed and seen this and seen that. And so our hope and, and as we gather is, well, let's see what God might do for me today. And so we gather and we tolerate the sermon and we tolerate a worship, a worship set that maybe isn't perfect for us and isn't our favorite songs. And we tolerate this and we tolerate that just so that maybe we can get something from Jesus. Is it any wonder that we're seeing people leave church in record numbers? When we're trying to consume the things of God rather than follow the ways of Jesus. This is what the crowds were doing. They were coming because he fed 5,000 people with five loaves and two fish. They were coming because every demon he spoke to was gone. They were coming because every lame person that he prayed for was healed. They were coming because they were seeing healings. They were seeing miraculous signs and wonders. And they were going, if I can just get to Jesus, then I will have my problems be solved. But there were only a handful that were willing to follow him. To truly follow him. And those were the ones he made known the the secrets of the kingdom of God. The things that, um, that he was saying through parables. And I don't know about you. But if I had to choose between just like... I think miracles are awesome. I think healings are awesome. We have people in our church right now that I'm praying every single morning, God, would you heal them? And I I hope to see those healings, but not at the expense of following Jesus. Church, I, I would trade a church full of miracles for a church following hard after Jesus every day of the week. We have to be a people that is following Jesus. Just following his words, following his ways. 
We don't want to be trying to piece together a puzzle that does not fit. So disciples abide in the word and help others abide in the word. So here's where our uh, discipleship process begins. So our first step is to know God. We want to know who God is. We want to know what his word says. Um, we want to know exactly like what we are supposed to do. And so that's why we have the purple book, which is designed with t- 12 chapters on all the basics of what it is to follow Jesus. It's why we have the alpha series happening in January, where you can ask questions about the basic stuff of the faith and not be ashamed to ask those things. It's why we have, um, uh, uh, accepting Jesus as part of it because to accept to to follow him you have to first accept him but I want us to think of it in this way when we start a new job you have your job description and it gives you a fairly you know it gives you a fairly good overview of what you're supposed to do right but if all you ever do is read the job description how many know you're not going to do a very good job on the actual job That when you show up and and all you do is just what's in the job description, you're not going to know where certain things go. You're not going to know how certain people act. You're not going to know all these things, right? And so this is why when you show up to a job after you've been hired, you're not just handed a copy of your job description and say, okay, get to work. No, any place that's functioning well, what do you do? You have someone who comes and gives you orientation, who works with you, who shows you how things work, who, who describe what, what to do when and how to do it when and all these things, right? You have someone to walk with you as you learn to do the job. This is what getting to know God is. It's, it's instead of just going, because I hear people all the time, oh, I've read the Bible. I didn't really get much from it. And I'm going, it's because you're just reading the job description and thinking you're going to know what to do. No, we got to get beside some people. We got to learn what it is to, man, those burgers smell amazing right now. It's just wafting in. But, um, but we're, we're getting beside some people and, and we're, we're learning what to do, how to do it. It's why we have the purple book, because it's not meant for you to just thumb through and go, oh, I've got this question or that question or that question and not have anyone to talk about it with. No, please walk through it with somebody, go to somebody, ask questions, send me messages, send me emails. I am never upset to answer an email with a question about those kind of things, but we want to know God, but then we have to turn up turn up the volume a little bit. We have to find freedom. And this is where we, we really start to look at what it is to obey the word of God. Let's see what this thing looks like in action, right? We just read, read a verse that said, the truth will set you free. So what does it mean to walk in freedom from the truth of the word of God? What does it mean to, to confess our sins to one another and watch as God works on us as a congregation? What does it mean to engage with abiding in Christ and, and having him speak to you on little things in your life and having him start to really work on who you are to be connected to the vine. This is what we want you to be learning to do. And it's just like, again, in your job, it's trusting the process. So once you have your orientation, once you've been told what to do, right, there is a season where you're just doing what you've been told to do. You're not going too far outside of it. You're not going too far this way or that way. You're doing what's been described to you. You're doing the ways that it's been shown to you. And you're just watching the process work itself out. This is what finding freedom is. And that's why we have set free and abide and baptism. It's trusting the process. Then uh, step three is to walk with God. And this is where we ask the question, I, I, see, I see this, this Bible and I see these principles and I see these verses and I see these things, but what does it say about me? Who am I in this process? And so after you've been at a job for a while, you start to learn, right? You start to learn the ins and outs. You start to learn what you can get away with, what you can't get away with. You, it's not that you're trying to do shoddy work or you're trying to, you know, make, make a, a bad product or, or, or not do what you're supposed to do, but you start to learn a more efficient way of doing it. You start to learn a better way of walking this out. You start to learn, uh, uh, you know, how, how much, you know, how much to, to lift here, how much to, to apply here 
here, how much to do this here. And so before you know it, you start to become an expert in your job. You start to learn your own ways. You're still doing the things that you you were first uh, ascribed to do, but now you're learning how to do it in your own way. And this is what it means uh, to walk with God. It's taking on the, the scripture. It's taking on this idea of who am I in light of this scripture that I'm reading. And so that's why we have the hearing God course. It's why we have being a part of small groups. It's why we have uh, the grow character devotional, because it's an opportunity for you to go, okay, enough just kind of learning how to do the job enough just learning what trusting the process now let's see who I can become in this place right once you've been once you've been a part of a church for or once you've been a part of a job for three or four or five years you start to learn hey this is my fit this is who I am. A- am I the guy that, that you know, if, if you're a, a place where they all have lunch together, am I the guy that speaks up first at lunch? Or am I the guy that throws in a little quip here or there? Am I the guy that listens and laughs? Am I, am I the one that, that, that stalks this? Am I the one that fixes this? Am I, right? And it maybe wasn't in your original job description, but you just learn who you are in that place. That's our goal for walking with God. And then finally, it's to discover your purpose. And this is the most beautiful part of discipleship. It's when you go, this is my fruit. This is the fruit I'm meant to bear. I'm, I, I'm abiding in the vine. I'm abiding with Jesus. I, I, I'm learning who I am in Jesus. I, I know who I am. I know how to enact this word that I'm reading. I know how to do these things. And here is the fruit that I have. This is who I am, and this is what I produce. John 15, 1 to 11, as I bring this to a close, says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, it, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this, my father is glorified that you may bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. As the father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be complete in you, and that your joy may be full. That was a lot of words, a lot of repetition, but here's what it's saying. It's saying we abide or know God. Then we obey and we see fruit. Then he prunes us by obedience to his voice. Then we know what to ask for. And we see him help us create more fruit as we ask for the right things. Then we are filled with joy because we are being everything he has called us to be. See, in these 11 verses, he's just, he's, he's laying out, here's how you do it. You abide in me. You obey me. I prune you. You produce fruit. You know what to ask for. And that makes you produce even more fruit. This is, this is the life of a disciple. This is the life of someone who follows Jesus. I go to Jesus all the time. Jesus then forms me and fills me and I start producing fruit. Then it comes a time when he starts speaking some things that are hard to hear. This is what we're going to be focusing on in holiness. I, I want you to act like this. I want you to try and do this. I want you to be like that. Hey, that's a little too out of whack in your life. You need to bring it back in, into, into consideration. He starts to prune us. When we get pruned, we produce 
more fruit. And then as we produce more fruit, then we start asking for the things that he wants us to ask for. And we ask for the things that he wants to ask for. When we ask for good gifts from our Father who is in heaven. He gives us good gifts and our joy is complete. This is the life of a disciple. And so here's what I'm saying. The old, I'm working on it. It doesn't work if you're not abiding with Jesus. If you're not abiding in the vine. You want to be pruned and shown what to do? There is about three steps before you get to the pruning stage. Abide, bear fruit, then he prunes. We're not even in the abiding spot and we're going, God, why aren't you working on me? Why am I not hearing your voice? Why, why, why am I not producing more fruit? I see this person over here and they're producing so much fruit and I'm just watching them as they're, as they're serving God and they're so joyful and they're so full and they're, they're, it's, it's, life still hits them, but it seems like they're just so much more fulfilled. They did the work of abiding. They did the work of following Jesus. They did the work of not just seeking after his stuff, but going, hey, I'm showing up morning after morning. I'm showing up evening after evening. I'm showing up on my lunch break. I'm showing up here and I'm showing up there and I'm taking the time to abide in Jesus. And then he shows me how to produce fruit. And then once I produce fruit, he goes, hey, if you want to produce more fruit, here's what you need to get rid of. Here's what you need to start growing in. And then you produce more fruit. And then you pray for stuff, it actually happens, and then you're full of joy. But if we never get to step one, we're never going to be disciples. A disciple is full of joy. If we're not full of joy, can we call ourselves discipled? So here's what I want to close with. Discipleship is my second closing, but that's okay. Discipleship is not just in reading the Bible, it's in living the Bible. So church, here's, here's my hope for you this fall. It's this simple, that you'll take one of our next steps, that you'll trust us with this process, that we have this, we have this kind of organized in a good way for you, that you will start taking those next steps and you'll start moving in through that discipleship track so that you can become who God has designed you to be because I cannot wait. I don't know how long it'll take. I don't know when that shift will happen, but I cannot wait until we gather as a church and there's more of us filled with joy as a true disciple than there are not. Can you imagine the praises that will ring? Can you imagine the humility that will be entered in with? Can you imagine the prayers that will be prayed by people who know exactly what to pray for because they've abided in the vine? Can you imagine what that church would look like? That church will have miraculous things happen as an exciting additive, not as a hope to, for Jesus just to give us his stuff. That church will already know what to pray for. That church will be filled with joy and be that attractive presence that we saw the early church be to all those around it. That's the church we want to be. So how do we do it? We do it by you and me and the person beside you and the person in front of you and the person behind you, and the person across the, the pew from you, all going, I am committing to abiding in the vine and taking steps to get closer to Jesus. Let me pray for you. God, thank you for this wonderful day. Thank you for the smell of burgers and hot dogs as uh, we get ready to eat together. Lord, thank you that you have designed us to be in relationship with you. Thank you, Lord, that you have done so much for us already, even though maybe we haven't been the best at abiding in you. 
But Lord, as we look to abide, as we look to become disciples who don't just say I'm working on it, but actually start doing something in the direction of discipleship. Lord, would you bless us? Lord, would you prune us? Lord, would you show us how to produce the most amount of fruit we are capable of doing? And Lord, would you fill us with your joy? And give this all to you in Jesus' name. Bless this food to our bodies. In Jesus' name, amen.